This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Funded in part by... All it takes is a spark. One idea to take flight. The courage to seek the unknown. To innovate. Disrupt. To move us all forward. To explore a different perspective. At NASDAQ, we connect the world. It's ideas. It's capital. It's businesses. The people that drive global economies. The future isn't tomorrow. It's right now. All it takes is a spark. NASDAQ. Up, up and away with the major averages at new highs should investors start picking stocks for the best returns. Trade talk. Japan's prime minister heads to the White House as the world's first and third largest economies try to forge a new economic relationship. Oil rush prices have more than doubled in a year, but what happens next is a little less clear. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Friday, February 10th. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sue Herrera. Tyler Matheson is off tonight. Investors end the week on a high note. The three major averages pushed further into record territory. The climb started yesterday with talk of tax cuts and continued today when President Trump mentioned infrastructure investment during a visit with the Japanese prime minister. The Dow Jones Industrial Average added 96 points to 20,269. The Nasdaq added 18 and the S&P 500 was up eight. For the week, stocks were higher across the board. And as Morgan Brennan reports, Wall Street's focus is squarely on Washington. The Trump reflation trade is alive and well. That is, investors are betting that President Donald Trump's policies will lift inflation and growth. It was evident today during a meeting at the White House between the president and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The two discussed plans for infrastructure spending and investments spurring U.S. manufacturing. And that gave materials, defense and aerospace, and other industrial stocks a boost, lifting names like Freeport McMoran and Vulcan materials to new highs. Lately, the markets have risen on just the mere mention of tax reform or infrastructure spending. But when issues like immigration and trade wars are on the table, they tend to drift slightly lower, suggesting the path of least resistance for stocks is higher, at least for right now. Today, Trump seemed to alleviate investors' concerns of any tensions with either China or Japan, the world's second and third largest economies, saying he had great respect for both countries and, quote, very warm conversations with both nations' leaders. Another issue for the markets, earnings. And next week, we'll bring a lot more of them. And that, along with Washington, could determine the direction of stocks. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan at the New York Stock Exchange. And as Morgan just reported, the U.S.-Japan economic relationship was indeed on display today at the White House. Trade between the two countries is worth nearly $270 billion, so there's a lot at stake for both sides. Eamon Javers reports. With a handshake and a hug, President Trump welcomed Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to the White House today, kicking off a weekend of diplomacy. We face numerous challenges and bilateral cooperation is essential. Our country is committed to being an active and fully engaged partner. The backdrop to this session was the relationship that both countries have with China. Although Donald Trump's phone call with Chinese President Xi Jinping last night seems to have smoothed things over for now. I had a very, very good conversation, as most of you know, yesterday with the president of China. It was a, a very, very warm conversation. I think we are on the process of getting along very well, and I think that will also be very much of a benefit to Japan. While Prime Minister Abe did not directly address China in his East Room remarks, he did allude to global trade frustrations in a speech before the Chamber of Commerce earlier today. Look at steel. Overproduction in a certain country has not ceased, and as a consequence, increase in export results in a depressed price for steel worldwide. Meanwhile, the president seemed to offer a prediction of sorts for global currency markets. As far as uh, the currency devaluations, I've been complaining about that for a long time. And I believe that we will all eventually, and probably very much sooner than a lot of people understand or think, we will be all at a level playing field. But it has to be fair, 
and we will make it fair. The two leaders departed for a weekend at Mar-a-Lago, dubbed the Winter White House, where they're expected to continue their discussions. The president will be personally paying for this trip to Florida. It's being described as a gift from the president to the prime minister and his wife. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eamon Jabbers at the White House. One specific topic of discussion between President Trump and Japan's prime minister was trade. For the two countries, that means discussing Japanese automakers and their role in the U.S. economy. Today, Japan's Abe said that the auto industry and other Japanese companies are looking to invest in the U.S. Phil LeBeau has more. When Japan's prime minister Shinzo Abe and President Donald Trump talk business, the question of how much Japanese automakers impact the U.S. economy will focus on where Japanese branded cars, SUVs and trucks are built. Last year, more than two-thirds of the vehicles Honda sold in America were built in America, a far greater percentage than Nissan and Toyota. Why does that matter? Because Donald Trump wants all automakers to build more of their vehicles in the U.S. That includes the Japanese, who sold 6.6 .6 million vehicles in America last year. Meeting with reporters, Trump and Abe did not specifically talk about Japanese automakers, while pledging to work on trade deals between the two countries. On the economy, we will seek a trading relationship that is free, fair, and reciprocal, benefiting both of our countries. While Shinzo Abe realizes President Trump wants more jobs in the U.S., that doesn't necessarily mean Japan will export fewer vehicles to America. But it could mean Japanese automakers will open more plants in the U.S., where they already have more than 25 manufacturing sites. At the same time, Japanese automakers have been expanding in Mexico, where many of the vehicles made ultimately are shipped up to the U.S. And Donald Trump has made it clear he wants the vehicles sold in the U.S. to be made in the U.S. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. Think back about one year ago. The markets were pretty much a mess. But some well-known businessmen had the foresight and the stomach to buy shares as their company's stock tumbled. And as Eric Chemi tells us, their bets paid off. One year ago, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon famously bought half a million shares of J.P. Morgan stock. With shares up 60 percent, he's made $16 million on that investment so far. But Dimon wasn't alone in buying shares at the bottom. We dug into insider transaction filings and found a few other heavy hitters were also buying, namely Treasury Secretary nominee Steve Mnuchin and Warren Buffett. Mnuchin loaded up on shares of CIT Group, where he was the vice chairman. Three separate trades in early February are now worth $5 million more today. The biggest buyer in total dollars was Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. It bought $78 million worth of Phillips 66, part of a longer accumulation of the company. The key thing, though, is Buffett did not panic when markets dropped, instead continuing to buy more. Just that one February purchase has earned more than $6 million. We found a couple more big-name buyers that actually earned a higher return than Diamond. Steve Wynn's $15 million purchase of his own company is up 67 percent. Not bad for one trade a year later. And then there's Elon Musk, who may have had the best trade of them all. He bought Solar City a year ago, sold it for Tesla stock in August, and then saw Tesla shares rise even more. In total, that original purchase has made him $7 million, or nearly a 70 percent gain. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eric Chemi. And it's not just the insiders seeing gains. With the major averages at new highs, there's growing belief that active fund managers could have a good year. And there are some early indications that January was indeed pretty good for them. So is stock picking making a comeback? Comeback, I should say. Uh, Jen Vietchna is a writer at Fortune magazine and joins us now to talk about that. Jen, welcome. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Nice to be here. What are you hearing from the managers that you're talking to? Well, the first thing, it's really important to, to say that Active managers haven't have been so excited to say how well that they well, how well they are doing and to make their case for active management after having a really bad more than 10 years where they really haven't most of them beat the market. So they'll be the first ones to tell you that actually active management is making a comeback. But there's choosier in this case because, as we know, the administration has kind of singled out certain industries that it wants some big changes in. So what are they looking at favorably? given the run-up we've had, and what, what are they avoiding? 
Yeah, the, what has really benefited them is they have tilted really heavily towards financial stocks, bank stocks, and technology, which have done really, really well, in part because the Fed has now raised interest rates. There's expectations that rates will continue to go up. So those sectors have done much better than um, you know, certain defensive sectors like utilities, um, high dividend stocks, retail has not done very well. So the benefit there is that if they've been tilted heavily to banks and technology, they've been able to actually beat the market or beat the uh, broad-based indexes where they're actually just investing in everything. So it yeah. helps to be choosier. Yeah, they're, they're being choosier. Healthcare, with the repeal and presumably the replacement of Obamacare, has, has been extremely volatile. Do many of them favor the healthcare sector in the anticipation that the new plan will be released? You know, they've actually been just wading very lightly into healthcare and pharma, too, because there's still some uncertainty um, over whether the Trump administration will try to enact some price regulation as far as drug prices go. People really don't know what's going to happen to Obamacare right now and what that will look like for hospitals and medical devices stocks. So people are very, very reluctantly wading into health care, right. sort of just tiptoeing there. But this is not to say that ETFs have not done well, correct? There's still money flowing into those. Oh, yeah. You just had BlackRock, um, which is the largest ETF provider, hit $1 trillion uh, in assets for the first time last month. So, and that's a tide that people really don't expect to stop anytime soon. There's lower fees. Warren Buffett's endorsed index fund investing. So mm -hmm. it's probably going to be the wave of the future, so to speak. All right, Jen. Thank you so much for your uh, perspective on that. Thank Jane you. Jane Vietchna much. joining us tonight with Fortune magazine. To the energy sector where oil output is plunging. That's the result of steep cuts made by oil producers to help alleviate one of the largest oil gluts in a generation. Today, the price of domestic crude did rise by more than one and a half percent to more than $53. But as Jackie DeAngelis reports, it was a much different story just one year ago. The diamond bottom for stocks also happened to be a bottom for crude oil. This time a year ago, oil prices saw a low of near $26 a barrel. Since then, prices have more than doubled. What drove prices higher? Well, lower prices closed down a lot of shale production, which cut supply and pushed prices up. And OPEC finally announced a 1.8 million barrel production cut late last year. There were also doubts as to whether members of the cartel would cheat. That doesn't seem to be the case. The International Energy Agency says that OPEC has carried out about 90 percent of its promised supply reduction. So OPEC supporting prices, and there are concerns that escalating tensions between President Trump and Iran could as well. Combine that with optimism over Trump's energy policies and a possible border adjustment tax, it all may be enough to keep crude where it is and slowly take it higher. But the shale threat remains real. Higher prices means that more of that production will come back online. U.S. rig counts were up almost 10 percent in January alone. Production in the U.S. has bounced around and the numbers are now creeping up. OPEC can't do m very much more for much longer. There's not a lot of coordination. The Saudis are taking much of the pain uh, and they're going to have to continue to do that. Meanwhile, the prices go up a little bit more. Shale snaps back in a big way. Uh, the swing producers here are the United States, ultimately, not the Saudis, not the OPEC states anymore. And Trump's policies are clearly favorable uh, for uh, cheaper uh, production costs and therefore more production gains out of the United States. So on balance, despite all the geopolitical tensions in the world, I still think that energy looks more bearish than bullish. If the shale players don't exercise caution, they could tip the market lower again. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis. The Federal Reserve official in charge of regulation will resign this spring. Daniel Tarullo, who has worked at the central bank since 2009, did not give a reason for his departure. The decision gives the president the ability to reshape the Fed's board, just as he begins to revamp the rules governing Wall Street. And there are reports late today that the White House is not planning on taking its immigration order to the Supreme Court. Last night, we told you that an appeals court upheld the block on the president's travel ban. Still ahead, is there potential trouble brewing in Europe that investors need to pay attention to?
The Food and Drug Administration approved a treatment for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's a rare type of that disease that we've been reporting on. The drug is made by Marathon Pharmaceuticals and is the first to win formal FDA approval, even though it's long been available outside the U.S. The new list price for the drug? is $89,000. That is 70 times higher than its price overseas. The drug is not a cure, but it has been shown to improve muscle strength compared with a placebo. President Trump's proposed wall along the U.S.-Mexico border could cost nearly $22 billion. As first reported by Reuters, it could take about three and a half years to build. The president's executive order also includes plans to hire more border agents, but that's proved difficult to do, as Kate Rogers reported for us from New Mexico last month. But now one high-ranking union official says the administration's focus on the border could make recruiting a little easier. Kate is back with the details. President Trump's plan to build a wall along the U.S.-Mexico border may be controversial, but one group is feeling optimistic about the new administration. The National Border Patrol Council, representing some 16,500 Border Patrol agents. The union, which has traditionally not endorsed a presidential candidate, threw its weight behind Trump during the election. The president's executive order to build the wall also included plans to hire an additional 5,000 agents, which may prove to be a challenge for the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol Agency, which is already seeking to fill some 1,700 agent positions. The union's vice president said that policies, including catch and release and the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, or DACA, have prohibited the agency's enforcement abilities. Many of the people that have left the agency uh, have left because they they got sold a, a false bill of goods. They were told they were going to be uh, doing this high-speed tactical job, and it turned out to be anything but that. Uh, I, I believe agents will get back to enforcing the law, and I think that will help to retain people that might be thinking about retiring early uh, or going to a, a local or state law enforcement job or another federal agency. While he stopped short of a full-on endorsement of the wall, Moran said each Border Patrol sector and station's individual needs should be considered. I think you need some kind of uh, physical barrier. It's been shown uh, throughout our history, and especially since we started Operation Gatekeeper, that the barriers work. Regarding reports on the wall's price tag, the Department of Homeland Security said in a statement, quote, as a matter of policy, we do not comment or confirm the potential existence of pre-decisional deliberative documents. The White House and U.S. Customs and Border Patrol did not immediately respond to requests for comment. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kate Rogers. Sears is cutting costs by at least $1 billion, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. After reporting a more than 10 percent drop in same-store sales for the holidays, the retailer unveiled a restructuring plan. Sears says it will achieve the cost savings by reducing corporate overhead and improving inventory management. The company also will cut debt and pension obligations by $1.5 billion. Shares of Sears popped 25 percent to $6.96. The advertising agency Interpublic Group said its higher-than-expected profit and revenue was helped by an increase in ad sales and lower taxes. The company also raised its quarterly dividend 20 percent to 18 cents a share, putting its annualized yield at about 3 percent. Shares rose 4 percent to $24.23. Shares of Skechers continued to rise today after that company said late yesterday that international growth drove its better-than-expected revenue. The footwear makers saw earnings miss, but it did report surprise growth in same-store sales. Analysts were expecting those to remain flat. The company also gave upbeat revenue guidance for the current quarter. Shares surged 19 percent to 27.78. And Allstate raised its quarterly dividend 12 percent to 37 cents a share. That's up from 33 cents. The annual yield is now nearly 2 percent. Shares rose marginally to $78.88. From Greece to France to Italy, is there potential trouble brewing in Europe that investors need to be aware of? Seema Modi is following the events overseas, and she joins us now. Good to see you, Seema, Great as always. Here. So let's start basically with Greece. There's okay. a, a large debt payment due soon, and we've seen this movie before. We certainly have. Uh, is, are we going to see a repeat, do you think? That's the concern. Because we've seen what has happened in the past, this specific debt situation has prompted a lot of concern. Here's the update. Uh, so far, Greece and its creditors have not been able to see eye to eye on the current terms of its bailout deal. Creditors are demanding stricter rules and stipulations. In Greece, the government there is coming back and saying we want to step away from austerity 
prosperity in order to see uh, an economic revival. All of this is happening before the summer, where one of the biggest debt payments is due, about 7 billion euros. And as we've seen in the past, a lot of times these negotiations take place till the very last yes, second. And that's exactly. a big concern for investors, that that will be the case once again. All right, a little further north okay. to France, we've heard about Brexit. Um, there's some talk in the market about, about a Frexit. I mean, could that actually happen? That's the, the key word now being used after those two political surprises, Brexit in 2016 followed by Trump's victory. The question is whether France, uh, there, a, a populist leader, Marie Le Pen, National Front Party, who has been campaigning for a Frexit, for France to leave the EU and the Eurozone, that's the big concern. She officially announced her candidacy over the weekend. Markets opened on Monday, and we started to see some concerns of this leader gaining traction in the polls mm -hmm. and her ability to win in the upcoming French election. That's why we saw a bit of movement in the bond market. Not to be left out, Italy, where the banks have been having trouble for a long time, right. but debt is the key issue. Absolutely. It's a combination of high debt, low growth, and a lot of dysfunctionalness in its banking sector. And a lot of this having to do also with the political system. The fact that we can see a lot of reforms get through, that means you're seeing a lot of stress being put on the banking system with no end in sight. Seema, thank you, I think. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Given all the trouble around the globe. We'll see what happens. But we appreciate it. Seema Modi. Yeah. All right, coming up, stocks with stocks at records. Can big returns be found in the small caps? Our market monitor is next. Here's a look at what to watch for next week. On Monday, President Trump meets with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Canada is a major trading partner with the U.S. On Tuesday, Fed Chair Janet Yellen faces the Republican Congress for the first time as she testifies on the economy. It is the first of two days of testimony. On Wednesday, Dow component Cisco is scheduled to release its earnings. And that's what to watch for next week. Time for our market monitor, who has the names of some small cap stocks that he says are poised to see above average earnings growth this year. The last time he was on, about two years ago, he recommended stocks that are both up and down double digits. He is Eric Marshall, co-portfolio manager of the Hodges Small Cap Fund. Eric, welcome back. Nice to have you here. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. And you, you would do expect some pretty good returns, and some of that is based on uh, what the Trump administration has promised, which is regulatory reform. Yeah, we, you know, we're just paying attention to what's going on out there within the prevailing business conditions. And I think within small cap stocks, you can always either find areas that are being overlooked or somewhat misunderstood. And where we can find above the average earnings growth in those areas and the market hasn't fully priced them in, that's where we're finding the greatest opportunities. Let's start with your first pick, Tower Semiconductor. It's small and independent. Yeah, this is a, uh, a, a small uh, a semiconductor specialty fab. And so uh, they're, they're in a position to see significant operating leverage in their business as they ramp the volume, uh, as you see improvement in the semiconductor industry in general. And uh, they'll come out with earnings next week. Uh, we expect them to have a relatively good quarter, but give a relatively positive outlook for 2017. So that's a name that you don't hear a whole lot about, but we think it's one that's underneath the radar and undervalued relative to the earnings expectations of the next couple years. Next on the list is Kansas City Southern. You say it's been unfairly punished and maybe misunderstood. Yeah, we, we really like their business long term. We think that they should grow above average relative to the other class one railroads out there like Union Pacific. But right now they're trading at a discount to the group because of their exposure to Mexico. And we think over time the trade uh, concerns with Mexico will be resolved. And we think sometime in the next uh, 12 to 18 months you'll see Kansas City Southern trade at or above the market multiple for the railroads. And finally, Eagle Materials, cement and wallboard manufacturer. 
Yeah, both of these, uh, cement and wall board, aren't exactly exciting areas to invest in, but they're areas <laughs> right now that are seeing good pricing power. We think that they're in the early stages of an earnings recovery in that business. They should do well uh, as infrastructure spending ramps up. And we continue to like the name right here. We think it's very much underneath the radar and underappreciated. You say there's been a recent price increase in the price of cement and wallboard. That works for them or works a little bit against them? Yeah, that's a positive. So we like to look at the Hodges funds. We like to find companies who sell products that are exhibiting pricing power. And when you're able to raise the price of your product, it allows you to expand your profit margins and see higher earnings. And ultimately, earnings drive stock prices. All right. On that note, Eric, thanks for joining us. Eric Thank Marshall you. with the Hodges Small Cap Fund. And that will do it for Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us this week. Have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll see you coming up on Monday. Nightly Business Report has been funded in part by... All it takes is a spark. One idea to take flight. The courage to seek the unknown. To innovate. Disrupt. To move us all forward. To explore a different perspective. At NASDAQ, we connect the world. It's ideas. It's capital. It's businesses. The people that drive global economies. The future isn't tomorrow. It's right now. All it takes is a spark. NASDAQ.